my heart I need to hear from you Lord, I need a word from you Word of hope, warm and mercy destiny this morning, that God would come and speak to our hearts once again. Speak to our hearts, Lord, because we need a word from you. I can't wait for a word from the Lord this morning. I hope you did too. Hope you did too. I want to say a thank you to our worship team. They are always amazing. They always set me in the right mood even when I come into this place not, not in the right mood. So I'm just, I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. 
Friends, our, our scripture comes to us this morning from Leviticus chapter 23, verse 22, and then Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. I thought we were done with Ephesians, but God had other plans. <laughs> Hear God's word first in Leviticus. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the alien. I am the Lord, your God. And now from Ephesians. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Oh Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Friends, I love to watch cooking shows. <laughs> All right. I love to watch cooking shows. There's a point where Food Network was one of the only things that Cassie and I watched. And a hearty welcome to Reverend Cassie Rapko, who is joining us this morning. <laughs> the only thing that we wanted to watch. On our first anniversary, we went back to the room and watched Chopped together. <laughs> That's that's what we wanted to do. We were so excited. We didn't have cable at the time at home. And so we watched Chopped. Uh, Chopped's one of my favorites. It's a, a cooking competition, if you're not familiar. And they have guest judges who are chefs and famous chefs. And they give you a basket of ingredients. And sometimes they're really strange ingredients, things you've never heard of and maybe wouldn't eat. Um, Sweetbreads is a favorite of theirs, those kinds of things. So I love those cooking competitions, though. And Alton Brown. Alton Brown is my other favorite. Alton has a show called Good Eats, and I've learned so much watching Alton Brown explain cooking. Uh, Cassie and I are, uh, fancy our, ourselves to be uh, adequate chefs. Adequate is the right word, I think. We've got our, our, our special hits, our greatest hits that we uh, prepare for those who um, come into our house, who are, we are entertaining. But uh, we, our ambition is to open a restaurant, this is a joke, by the way, is to open a restaurant called Mediocre, where the food is just really solid, it's not great or spectacular. It's not super fancy. It's not winning any Michelin stars, y'all. <laughs> but it's good enough to want to come back, right? Part of uh, what I love in these cooking shows is what the, these, these chefs 
do with these ingredients that they're, they're throwing a curveball by. And sometimes what they do is they make this deconstructed dish. Have y'all ever heard of this? It's when you take something like an egg roll uh, and you have all the ingredients there, but it's not in the form that you normally have it in. It's not in egg roll form. It's cabbage and carrots and maybe fried wontons on top of a, a, a bed of rice. And the idea is that you separate out the ingredients in a weird and different way to see how they influence the dish, to see what they add to the dish and what having them in this form with a, a, a fried wonton surrounding them takes away from the dish, takes away from these ingredients. This process of deconstruction is not usually received well on cooking shows. The judges aren't often impressed. Mm. But sometimes it works. This next month, y'all, this next month, we're going to be doing some deconstructing of dishes, the dish of our faith. The faith that society and even our closest relatives have passed on to us. And addressing some of those individual sayings that might work and might not. When we take our faith apart and we, and we look at some of these phrases like today's, God helps those who help themselves. Sometimes they might help. But a lot of times, they actually hurt our faith. And they certainly aren't true 100% of the time. And I don't know about you, but I could use all the help I can get when it comes to my faith. And I can stand to avoid all the harm that I can avoid when it comes to my faith. And I want us together to have a faith that's based on as much truth as we can get to, not just half the truth, not just partial truth, yeah. the whole truth. At the very least, this worship series should help us to read and encounter these phrases like God helps those who help themselves and know that they are not actually in the Bible. Most of the time, the people who say these phrases do not mean harm by them. I, I believe that. They're repeating something that's been passed on to them, but it's only partial truth. And we want you to have a faith that stands up in the world when things are not easy. A faith that will help you to love and to serve. A faith that doesn't stand up to one verse out of context in the Bible and then crumble when it reads the context of the verse or another verse that casts your faith into doubt. So that's what we're doing. And this work isn't easy because a lot of the things that we're going to be looking at and hearing about that aren't in the Bible are things that a lot of people actually think are in the Bible. And it might upset you to hear that some of the things that you've been saying, not, oh, no, not you, but someone else, surely someone else, right? You don't say these things. It might upset you to hear that these things are not actually biblical. And so if you catch yourself in your feelings during this series, that's okay. Talk to us about it. Don't just sit there and be angry. Talk to us, me and Pastor Jasmine, and start a discussion. Come to Sunday Grow Group, whether in person or virtually, and there's going to be space there to talk this out. That's the series that we're doing. But having said all that, buckled up. Because things are about to get heavy, y'all. 
Uh, in his book, Half Truths, Adam Hamilton, uh, A-list UMC pastor, <laughs> celebrity pastor, who is the lead pastor at the United Methodist Church at the Resurrection in Kansas City area. He writes that a study by Barna, which is a Christian polling firm, found that eight out of 10 Americans think God helps those who help themselves is in the Bible. Eight out of 10. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. That's a lot. Not only that, but this was a response to the question, can you name one of the Ten Commandments? Yikes. Another preacher might say that eight out of ten people need to read their Bible more. But that would only be halfway true because society has given us this one. Much more than the church has, I fear. This phrase is not found anywhere in scripture, but it was popularized by Benjamin Franklin, who was himself a deist. And if you don't know what a deist is, it, it, that's someone who thinks that God is a master clockmaker. That when God made the heavens and the earth, God was really just setting them up and, and getting them running and wound up creation like a clock and then just let it run. That God doesn't intervene in this world. I've got news for Deus. <laughs> Jesus Christ is a real problem for you because that is God intervening in the world. And so of course, Benjamin Franklin being a deist put a lot of emphasis on human responsibility. But like most of the phrases that we will talk about in this series, this sounds right, doesn't it? I like the golf. <laughs> I have a terrible slice, y'all. If you don't know what uh, a slice is, it's when you get up to the ball and you get your swing and you swing and it starts going straight and it goes a long way. And then all of a sudden, whoosh, to the right for me, if you're a lefty to the left, into the trees usually. I do this so much that my friends have started to call me Ricochet Rapco because they hit the ball hits the trees and sometimes it bounces back into the fairway, which is nice. One of my good buddies usually says, well, you hit the ball well, meaning that it went a long way just in the wrong direction. And that's the case with the phrase, God helps those who help themselves. The people who say this are partially correct, maybe about one third correct, but they just end up going the wrong direction. So there's a sense in which this phrase is correct. Let's start with that. God does indeed help people who help themselves. What this phrase is getting at is that we have some responsibility in the process of living life. We have to. If you believe in free will, and if you don't, you're in the wrong denomination. I can help you with that. We have to have the ability to respond to God's grace in real, meaningful ways. Grace directed toward us always requires a response from us. God's not going to make you love him. That's just not what God does. So when we thank God for providing the food that we're about to eat on our dinner table, when we thank God for the promotion that we received at work, when we thank God for the healing of our bodies after a surgery, there is always some responsibility on our end. We worked to earn the money to buy the food from, for dinner from the grocery store. It didn't just appear on our table after we prayed for it like something out of Harry Potter. <laughs> I hear you, Mr. Bill. <laughs> we worked hard at our jobs to get that promotion to show the people who are in charge that we were worthy of that promotion, that we deserved it. We listened to our doctors 
and took the medicine we needed to take and did the hard work of physical therapy. Can someone say amen to that? To get our bodies back to a functioning, a new state, a new but functioning state, right? God wants us to do what we can do and to let God do what we cannot do. And finally, to learn the difference between the two. God wants us to be responsible for what we can be responsible. But there is a sense in which this phrase, God helps those who help themselves, isn't just wrong, but it's sinful. Think about when other people, not you, never you, when other people say this. Most of the time, the people who say this are looking for an excuse not to help somebody. Not to help uh, the person who is right in front of them. They're looking for a justification to pass by the person holding up a sign at the intersection every morning. As they drive by to go to work. They're looking to feel morally superior for themselves. Because darn it. I work hard to make my money. And they don't work. That person is just trying to get others to do what I've already done for myself. Maybe they ought to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and get a job and earn some money. By the way, an aside, it is physically impossible to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I really wish we would stop saying this as a society. And if you think like that, I don't blame you for thinking differently than the Bible. I blame capitalism and the Protestant work ethic and society. Friends, over and over again, the Bible commands us to take care of those who cannot take care of themselves. It's not a polite request from God. Take care of those who can't take care of themselves if you feel like it. Yeah, sure. Do y'all remember that passage from Leviticus 23 that I just read? When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the alien. I am the Lord your God. You know who could not grow food for themselves? The poor and the alien, the widow and the orphan. But here God is telling the Israelites to leave food for the ones who cannot help themselves or provide for themselves. Over and over again, God directs the Israelites to take care of the widow, the orphan, the resident alien, the immigrant. They are, they are the ones in society who did not have protectors. They had no one providing for them and they couldn't provide for themselves. In fact, God says through the prophet Isaiah that this is one of the reasons that Israel was exiled, that they didn't take care of those who couldn't take care of themselves. Listen to Isaiah chapter one, verse 23. Everyone loves a bribe and pursues gifts. They don't defend the orphan and the widow's cause never reaches them. Isaiah goes on to say, well, now the Northern Kingdom is going to be taken out into exile because of a long laundry list of things that they failed to do. So instead of, of following the biblical directive to help those who literally cannot help themselves, we look for a way out by quoting a saying that we've been told is biblical, but really it isn't at all. And if we think, well, maybe they should get a job. It's just not that easy. Most jobs requ require forms of identification and a mailing address to get a job. What is somebody who doesn't have a mailing address supposed to do when their job interviewer asks them for a physical mailing address? 
what is somebody who has no ID because the state took their ID going to do when their potential employer asks for their ID? So no, it's not as easy as just telling someone to get a job. How about we meet the needs of the people who need help first while we equip folks for future success by helping them to get what they need to get a sustainable job? Wouldn't that be better? Or better yet, we could support folks who are actually already doing this. Did you know just down the street, Central Presbyterian Church has an outreach and advocacy center that helps people who don't have IDs to get their documents. This is vitally important work that's already being done. I refer folks there often when they don't have IDs. And they don't just do IDs, they do social security cards, they do birth certificates, all the things that you could possibly need. And so that's one part of why this saying is not actually helpful. That we are just skirting our own responsibility to help when we say this. But the second part of the, the reason that it's not helpful for us to say that God helps those who help themselves is because God has always been in the practice of helping those who cannot help themselves. Our passage for this morning really drives this home to us. Paul reminds us, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we may walk in them. There is nothing that we could have done to help ourselves from sin. This is Christianity 101. We are saved through grace, by grace, through faith. And there's no part of that grace that depends on us. Grace is a free gift that we did nothing to earn. We encounter it before we were ever aware of our need for it. It's called prevenient grace. We encounter it when we repent. We encounter it when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. And we encounter it as God moves us toward better love of God and neighbor. There is no part of us in grace. It's completely one-sided. But we also have a responsibility because of grace. And that responsibility is that we have been created in Jesus Christ for good works. The good news of Jesus Christ has always been God helps those who cannot help themselves. That's what we celebrate at this table. Whenever we participate in the sacraments, we celebrate the fact that God helped us when we couldn't help ourselves. That's why we gather in worship and praise to God. It's God's faithfulness that is worthy of our praise, not our own faithfulness. It's God's grace that is worthy of our praise, not our own works. It's God's goodness that is the source of all good things in our lives, not our own worthiness. It's all God, not us, because we can't save ourselves. So what does that mean for you and I? Well, first, we need to recognize that on some level, we all need help. We are not super people. Unless you are, and by all means, please tell me, because I have a list of things that I'd like you to do. We're not super people. We need God more than we're aware. But second, that means that we need to both pray and to be about God's work. 
at the same time. I was watching recently the representative uh, Hakeem Jeffries. Y'all know Hakeem Jeffries. He's the House Minority Leader. And he was giving a speech recently that summed up how people of faith ought to pray and work at the same time. And you may not agree with Hakeem uh, Jeffries and his politics, but I loved what he had to say. Here's what he said. We've got to strategize on Sunday. Meet the moment on Monday. Take it to him on Tuesday. Work it out on Wednesday. Thank the Lord on Thursday. Fight the power on Friday. Set it off on Saturday. And then get a couple hours of sleep and do it all over again until joy, joy, joy comes in the morning. <laughs> Did you hear the prayer in that? Did you hear the work in that? Yeah. It's both and. It's not just God. It's God with us. We participate with God. We do it together. That's the kind of relationship that God wants from us. It's a cooperation, Ms. Ruby. It's a cooperation. That speech reminded me of the Reverend Senator Raphael Warnock who is prone to say that a vote is a kind of prayer. It's a prayer in action. We've got to pray sometimes. We've got to pray all the time. And sometimes, as the civil rights movement in America showed us, we've got to pray with our feet. Friends, there's work to be done. There are people who cannot help themselves praying for God's help and waiting for the church to respond as God's hands and feet in this world. This is what it means to serve our neighbors. Sometimes our actions are, are God's answers to the prayers of those we encounter who genuinely cannot help themselves and even those that can help themselves. And we're doing a good job of that here at Atlanta First. We're doing a good job of meeting those needs. But here's my question. Can we do more? Can we do more as individuals in our daily lives? Can we do more as a church to help those who can't help themselves? Because God helped everyone and continues to do so, whether they can help themselves or not. So let's get rid of that phrase and replace it with a better one. God helps all, period, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Friends, if you will stand in body or in spirit and receive this benediction. Go into this world, get out of here. <laughs> in the name of Jesus, get out of here and go do what God has done for you. Go help someone who can't help themselves. Amen. Amen. Go help someone who can help themselves. Just go help someone. Amen. Because God has helped you. Amen. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One God now and forever go in peace. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn Face